Let her sleep since I am She's but not a
And hello everybody and welcome once again to another live stream here on the Outdoor Station. I know it's been a while since we've been here, but um, I've sort of decorated. What do you think I've like? I like what I've done to the place. Um, I've got I've got Lisa who's joining us in the uh, in the green room at the moment. I've got her on another screen just on the left hand side of the camera there, and she's waving at me, drinking her tea, which is uh, sort of quite calming. So uh, let's first of all just welcome everybody. First of all, welcome everybody that's joined us live. Thank you very much for for joining in. I've got uh, various names popping up on the screen in front of me, so we'll come to you in a second. Uh, secondly, welcome to everybody that's watching this after the event. Um, hopefully, uh, you'll get something from it, and it'll be a bit entertaining and enjoyable and slightly informative. And of course, welcome to people who are listening on the audio side, just on the podcast, which is going to be released in a few days' time as well. So all aspects are covered. Uh, what else have I got to say? Well, um, we are struggling at the moment on the technology front. We have, uh, I've mentioned it a few times, but basically we're currently running off a 4G signal and a very nice man holding a fiber cable is, is standing outside the door and hopefully he'll plug us in in the next week or so. He was supposed to be several weeks ago. So I didn't want to delay doing this anymore because of COVID, obviously. And uh, tried to bring a bit of outdoor love and sharing a bit of uh, knowledge, entertainment, and a bit of fun with, uh, with the audience. And of course, my guest this evening, as mentioned, is Lisa Cutcliffe from Edulous Wild Foods. Now, Lisa is a educator and instructor in foraging. So she's got a wealth of uh, knowledge and information. And if you'd like to look back at our first conversation we had, which was back in springtime, uh, there's a pile of information there. But she did say at the time, autumn was the time to actually have a conversation. So welcome once again, Lisa. Oh, wrong camera. I'll do that again. <laughs> welcome once again, Lisa. Hi. Nice to see you. Thank you. Nice to have you back. Thanks for, for joining us. And of course, the other camera was actually going to Rose. Give us a wave, Rose, who's in the chat room there. She's uh, doing all the tech side of things, folks. So by all means, have a chat with Rose and uh, she'll wave at us when uh, there's things uh, going on there and conversations going on there. So the whole thing is designed to be interactive uh, and we're doing as much as possible along those lines. So let's first of all um, check out how obviously have you guys been? How's everybody been regarding this uh, shutdown Mark II? And of course, uh, Lisa, how have you found it these last few months? Oh, it's been hard, hasn't it? I, I, as you say, I teach foraging and normally I have quite a large group and we all huddle around when I show them a plant or a mushroom or something like that and we just haven't been able to do foraging courses so it's been a quieter year on that front. Um, I do have another job as well but um, that's pretty much unaffected by it but yeah the foraging stuff I'm, I'm really missing teaching and traveling. I, I, I usually go all over the country in my camper van and just go foraging and learning about other environments that aren't just Yorkshire. Um, so yeah, it has been different. Have you um, have you found, due to the lack of people, I suppose, the number of people who are going around at the moment, that the wildlife and the areas that you normally forage have actually rested, as it were, for for the year? Uh... Um, actually, no, because it it's just as abundant as usual. And I think more people have been going out on their sort of daily exercise and maybe they've got more time to walk the dog longer or I haven't noticed a difference in abundance at all. I think it's just as abundant as it always was. OK, OK. Uh, right. So what are we going to be talking about tonight? I know you've got a series of slides set up and a, a, a bit of show and tell. So, uh, so tell us what you're going to tell us to talk about tonight. Yeah, well, I mean, autumn is just, I could talk about autumn for a whole day and we wouldn't run out of species to talk about. But I've just chosen a few key ones that are e they're either really delicious and sought after for that reason, or they're very abundant. Um, and so they're, they're around, they're very common, and you can collect a lot of it quite easily without affecting the ecosystem. And then other things are maybe a bit more unusual that you didn't know we could eat um that are common as well 
Okay, well, let's start with our um, our do's and don'ts, uh, which is obviously yeah, the basic rules, what's most important things to, to get that sorted. So uh, I've prepared a couple of slides uh, under your guidance. So uh, we'll start with the do's. Yeah, I do have to cover this. I know we went over it last time, but every time I talk about foraging, we do have to cover the do's and don'ts because it could be very dangerous if you didn't follow these rules. Um, so let's start with the, the do's first. It is um, foraging to follow the countryside code. We can pick foliage, fruits, flowers and fungi. That means we can't be uprooting things um, without the landowner permission. We need to go lightly, tread gently, um, not to disturb the ecosystem too much and just take what you can eat, you know. We, you need to know not only if something is edible or not, but you also need to know what you need to do to make it edible. And there's a few things we might talk about later on that need certain processing before they're edible. And you can go on courses and that kind of thing, but really the best thing to do is to get some good field guides and foraging ID books and that kind of thing, because they're peer reviewed, they are you know, the best information you're going to get online can be a little bit tricky because a lot of things are mislabeled and, you know, there's some scary mislabeling I've seen actually online. So online is a great resource for looking at an image library or something like that. Once you think you know what you've got, start with books is always my recommendation. And you need to understand the law and it's up to you to check the rules of the area that you're looking to forage in. So that's the do's. What's on the don't slide that I haven't covered already? Um, okay, the don'ts. Yes, yeah, so I've already mentioned not uprooting things. That is against the countryside code without permission. Um, and yeah, never take all of, any, of everything. Just just take a little bit and leave plenty to spore or to seed or to carry on growing. And don't trespass or sell for commercial gain without permission again from the landowner. And you need to be aware of invasive species such as Japanese knotweed or Himalayan balsam. Bits of those plants could even get in the grooves of your boots and you could go treading it around. So just be really aware when you're trimming things and chucking things on the compost heap. Just because something's edible, you also need to know how it can reproduce where you don't want it to. So that's just something you need to be aware of. And the golden rule, if in doubt, leave it out and that is to never eat anything unless you're 110% sure of its identity and that you know which parts are edible because sometimes not all of it is edible. Elder, for example, the berries and flowers are edible, but the rest of the plant's actually quite toxic. Uh, we won't go into shellfish, we're not really covering that today, but there's, there's rules around shellfish sizes and seasons. Um, and the other thing is, yeah, don't. I don't tend to publish where I'm foraging online because I think it can mean that too many people might go to that place and it won't be able to cope and I think that's not great so you know part of the fun is finding your own places sure sure um just I uh, though you don't want to talk about the the, the shellfish or seafood uh, in detail but when you said check yep. the legislation where would you actually go to look for that legislation um gov.uk defra so just just search for it um there'll be guidelines on it's usually for commercial fishing but then there's also guidelines on which months so for shellfish like you wouldn't want to be harvesting them in months um without an r in them right. so the okay. summer months basically uh because okay. that's when they're breeding they're much smaller uh because they lose weight in that time and you want to leave them to breed so that we have more fine okay also, right well let's top the gallery as well well, yeah, that's it. There, there are. I'm aware of that type of thing. I just wondered if there was a particular place that you'd recommend for for information. But um, yeah, let's let's come on to your your slides then that you've prepared. Now, I shall um, I shall I, I recognise these because I drink a lot of variations of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we'll start in the hedgerows. Um, you will have probably will have heard of hawthorn and elder. The elderberries are particularly brilliant sort of around September time, but they can persist a little longer. I make vinegars and syrups and gins and all sorts of things out of the elderberries. Also a really good cough syrup. We'll come on to medicinals later and I'll come back to elderberries for how good they are for medicinal properties. But they're just 
earthy and rich and they're, they're wonderful. So I think they're completely underrated. Sloes, which are the fruit of the blackthorn. You'll have heard of them mainly because of sloe gin, but you can do more than that with them. They are quite sour. They're very astringent and tart. So you do usually need to cook them and to add sugar. But they're worth it. They're, they're basically a mini plum. They're in the plum family. They're a stone fruit. Hawthorn is in the apple family. And it, um, I make a great ketchup with it. It makes a fantastic ketchup. Oh, really? I never tried that. Yeah. It's also good for your heart and your circulation medicinally. Um, well, we, we had a conversation earlier on before we started about the um, the uh, help the immune system. So as you say, we'll come on to the good things uh, sort of once we finish the this section and you can perhaps uh, touch on that. But uh, I didn't mm -hmm. know that about Hawthorne. And uh, slows, obviously, yes, well, we we enter a slow gin competition in the local pub at Christmas time, but I'm not sure if that's going to happen this year. But there you go. Yes. Um, chestnuts. I've been doing some stuff with chestnuts this week. Um, you need to know the difference between the sweet chestnuts, which have these very hedgehog-like shells, and they are pointy. I don't know if you can see this, but um, they have a little point on the top. This one actually isn't very pointy anymore. But they're, they're not round. They're not like a conker. They have a, a point on the top, and they have little spines just off the top here. They usually have one, one or two flat sides, um, whereas horse chestnuts are, are not good for us. But sweet chestnuts, I've been... Um, I put them in pies and made flour out of them. And I've also been candying them. So this is a candied chestnut, which um, I know as Maran Glass or Glace. Um, they're a really beautiful sweet made out of the, the candied chestnut. There's lots you Would can you, do with um, them. Yeah, I mean, the candied one, that's interesting. So you leave it in the shell, do you, to, to candy it? No, no, you have to... Um, so you obviously take out the outer shell, the, the green one, and then the, the brown shell. You there's um I've got a small knife. It's only got a very small blade on it. It's a chestnut knife, and that's perfect for peeling it off. So you take off the outer shell. There's also a brown sort of papery skin around the nut as well. You need to try and get as much of that off as you can. You can blanch them um, quickly in very hot water. But you don't want to cook them or they go soggy. You can blanch them and that makes it easier to peel as well. So you can do small batches of that because they'll only peel off while they're hot. Um, and then you make a sugar syrup and you heat them up in the sugar syrup for about 10 minutes. Then you leave them to cool and you leave them to soak in the syrup. And you do this like five times. Excuse me. So it takes a couple of days of just five minutes of heating and they gradually absorb all of that syrup and they become a, a candied sweet. And then you dry them out in the oven. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, I think there's nothing bit, worth... Uh, say again? It's a bit of a labour of love, but it's worth it. Well, that's what I was about to say, is is that I think a lot of people don't realise that uh, a lot of the wild foods do, in fact, take a fair amount of time to get the best from them. Don't they? They're not necessarily like popping to the supermarket, are they? No, that's right. A lot of things need um, processing, cooking, and it's not even getting to the cooking stage. It's taking all the stalks off, all that kind of thing. Um, and it's why a lot of people don't bother with them and why we started farming is because a lot of these things were a pain <laughs> and, and it, it takes a lot of processing, a lot of time to get the best out of them. But they're full of goodness and flavour. So if you're just doing small batches for yourself at home, I think it's well worth it. Excellent. Excellent. So these ones will be interesting. Yeah. So one of the foods you may not know you can eat is acorns, because I think we're taught that they're poisonous and they are if they're raw, but they're not actually got a they haven't got a toxin per se. They are really tannic. They are full, chock full of tannins. But if you leach them in cold water, um, which I'm doing over here, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but I've got a bowl. Uh, so oh, I've right. shelled them. And I'm leaching them in water, and the water's a bit yellowy, and that's the tannins coming out. So I'm gradually changing the water every time I come into the kitchen. It has to be cold, or otherwise it ruins the starches. But what I'm going to do is grind those up and make a flour. And I've already made some, and those little hedgehog buns that you can see there, they have hedgehog mushroom in the middle as well, like a duck cell of hedgehog mushroom inside these little buns, but they were made of acorn flour too. Wow, I, I, I thought those were some other acorns that I hadn't seen before. I didn't reckon realize they were buns. <laughs> <laughs> no, they were they were lovely little hedgehog bread buns. Excellent. 
Lovely to see. No, I think this is this is the uh, chanterelles would be the one I think most people are probably uh, interested in recognising at all possible. Yes, chanterelles are a great one for beginners because they're very distinctive. They're a bright egg yolk yellow, and they there is a false chanterelle um, which you need to get familiar with, but it's not deadly or anything. So if you get the wrong one, it just won't taste very nice. But you shouldn't have too many of them. But um, I think you'll soon realise you've got the wrong one. Chanterelles, the, the good, the true chanterelle that you see here. I don't know if you can see bottom right, I guess, as you look at it. They're, they aren't true gills. They're sort of ridges or like wrinkles, and the ones that are upside down. And they're, that's one of the features. But also they have white flesh inside. So if you scrape off those, those wrinkles on the outside, you will have white flesh. Whereas the false chanterelle, which is far less substantial, much more orangey, um, growing under conifers, and it... It, it's sort of orangey peachy all the way through and it has true gills which are, are blades that you could sort of run your finger over um, much more uniform so th without showing you and going into it in detail but look it up if you're looking for chanterelles make sure you know about the false chanterelle as well just as a thought uh, to help people again at this particular moment in time obviously we are now what are we beginning of november um it might be worthwhile mentioning as we're going through these what people might find currently because i know that we've sort of just passed over the best time i think uh, on some of the uh, and some of the flungi yes but um certainly down south it's been mild and they're still finding tons of these these species right now even in scotland people are still finding some stuff in the milder areas so it's not over yet but it, as soon as we have a hard frost, a lot of these things are not available anymore. But we're going, we'll come on to some species that will be available even when the frost comes, as long as it's not hard, hard, deep, deep frost. Um, the, on the slide before, there was a couple more just to talk about. Um, oh, yeah. The hedgehog mushroom, because I've got some of those. So the one in the middle, uh, you can just see the spines on it there. But I've got one here as well. And it's it has teeth underneath. So it hasn't got gills and it hasn't got spongy pores. Ah, oh, it's in reverse. <laughs> um, it, it's so distinctive that there's, there's nothing you could possibly confuse this with. They are creamy peachy. They look like puddles of cream in the leaf litter. And that's an excellent one for beginners. And they like they partner with quite a few trees, beech, pine, spruce, birch, oak, um, maybe some other ones. So they're really um, good to do. And then finally on that page, there were some amethyst deceivers, which are bright purple. And they're, they're yeah, not so yeah. tasty, but they are absolutely beautiful. And they're often in the same environment as the other two. I know some people have also asked last time about when is the best way to, or what is the best way to, to eat them? Um, I know you, it, you have the brushes to brush off the soil sort of thing. But uh, yes. do they need preparing? Uh, is it best not to eat them raw? I wouldn't recommend eating mushrooms raw in general, especially if you're learning. There are some mushrooms like porcini and um, and actually, strictly speaking, the amethyst deceivers, you could eat those raw, I guess. But it's not a good idea. and They're not very digestible raw either. So it's best to cook your mushrooms. And for a vast number of the species that are a little bit toxic, cooking will make them OK to eat, or at least it won't be a disaster for you. There's only a few that even cooking just will do nothing to the toxins like the death cap and the destroying angel. But um, some of the others, you know, you'll be less ill if you've cooked them. The so you shouldn't be eating them unless you're 100% sure that you can still be sure and wrong. So it's just another safeguard as well as it being better for your digestion. Excellent. With, well, I think... with this disease, you need to make sure that there's no heavy metals in the soil because they can absorb those. Right, right. Well, I think we've got a few uh, uh, conversations or comments in the, in the chat. So I'm just going to pop over to Rose in the chat room. Yeah, um, Flying Sprouts just said, uh, could you tell him something about the cauliflower mushroom? He thinks he found one a few weeks ago, Lisa. If you could, is that one that you could uh, Got a slide of? explain a little bit about, maybe? I certainly Confirm can. I don't, or have a deny. Slide of it. I don't have a slide of it, but I do have one right here. Um, this one is a very small one. This looks like a bath sponge from Greece or something, but it is actually a cauliflower mushroom. These grow at the base of pine trees, mainly, um, Scots pine in the UK. And they are quite quite delicate. It's um, sporatus crisper, and crisper means it will fall apart and, and be quite brittle. Um, 
and they're nutty and they're really, really tasty, but it's hard getting all the, the needles out on any forest floor gubbins. Um, but yeah, uh, what else could it look like? Do they There's stay the same really colour through their life? Like... Do they stay the Sorry, same colour through their life? The, the colour of the mushroom, does it change? Does the colour of the mushroom change? As it as it as time passes, as it matures, uh, it, they they can be a bit whiter than this one, a bit creamier when they're a bit younger. This one's I've had this about a week and a half, so it's um I'm saving it um, for this, but it, it's it's not it's a bit more yellow than they usually are. They're often a little bit brighter. Um, can we can we see it again, they please, can be, uh, Lisa? They can be this. One. Sorry, could we see it again, please? Yeah just so people can get more of an idea. Do carry on. Sorry to interrupt you. It's harder than the delay, isn't it? Um, I, I, it can't focus properly, but it, it's very sort of frondy and convoluted. And inside it's almost like a cauliflower. It's sort of branching almost um, from the central point where it comes up around the tree. And it will always be on, around the bottom, around the roots, not up the tree or too far away from it. Okay. Okay, well, let's uh, get back to your to your slides then. The hen of the woods. Now, I've heard of a chicken of the woods, yeah, but never the hen. Or is this the same thing? Yeah, it's similar. Um, this one is, it's got bigger, flatter fronds that almost look like feathers. So it's called the hen because if you imagine a, I don't know, a hen pheasant or something roosting at the bottom of, a, of a, an oak tree with its head tucked in, it's almost what it looks like. Again, they can be absolutely massive. That was several kilos, that one um really generous and again it's medicinal too as well as absolutely delicious it's probably my second favorite mushroom after the the horn of plenty which we'll come on to it's delicious but it's also yeah medicinal it's very good for you um immune system for all-round health it's it's called maitake in japan and um in america they call it that as well often and it, it's yeah if you find one you've got a lot of food it's great. It dries well too, and you can make a powder. So you can take it as a powder as well as putting it on your food and, and frying up the fronds. It's delicious. You always uh, you always make me feel hungry every time I talk to you, <laughs> um, as I'm sure everybody else is feeling at the moment. Uh, and I just wanted to say, folks, by all means, uh, add a few things to the uh, into the chat room if you would. I've got the screen in front of me here, um, and Rose is obviously waiting to to answer or or advise you or help you or pass the message on, basically. But what I do want to do, and I perhaps forgot to mention at the very beginning, is that towards the end of the show we'll be doing a Q and A with sort of specific questions. So if you've got a, a definite question or something that arises as we're talking at the moment, then uh, just put a capital Q at the, the beginning of the question and, uh, and add your question after that, and we'll pile it in, add them to the list at the end. Uh, so we've, uh, Hen of the Woods, should we move on to the next one? Yeah, because there's a lot of species here. I'm just touching on things that people can go away and research for themselves um, and find out what's in their area. This is something that I was picking up in Scotland. Bilberries are all over the country and then they're like sort of heathery moorland kind of environment, sometimes in woods as well if the soil's acidic. But the other one, the red one, is cowberry or lingonberry. And you tend to only find those in sort of the highlands, really. Um, and of course, in Scandinavia, where we know it from for the, the berry sauce that comes with Swedish meatballs and things like that. They are they're much tartar. Um, so that I was picking that particular jar full to make a sort of wild cranberry-like sauce for Christmas. I always pick myself a jar full so that I can make our Christmas sauce every year while I'm up in Scotland in sort of September time. But they, the cowberries persist right into November, December, sometimes if it's not too um, frosty. And the bilberries, they come out a bit earlier. So in Yorkshire, they're out around July, August. So I pick them on the heathery hillsides around Leeds then. And uh, they're great in pies and yeah, anything you want to do with a berry. They're basically a blueberry, so anything that a blueberry would work for, bilberries work for as well. There's some lovely um, ice lollies this year, for example. Fabulous. Um, these few are sort of some colourful ones. Um, you've got the grey oyster. I think most people are actually familiar with oyster. These are the same species as you buy in the shops if you get oyster mushrooms in an exotic uh, mushroom pack or something like that. But those ones, the wild ones there, 
that they only go that colour really in winter. They go a real lovely dolphin grey. They're absolutely beautiful. The top two there are oysters, the little ones on the right and also the, the larger frilly ones in the top middle. There's aniseed funnels, those loomy green turquoise ones um, on the top left and in the basket in the middle. They smell strongly of aniseed and they're just this beautiful sort of aqua green blue in the leaf litter. Really pretty. Smell amazing. And then the wood blue, it is purple. It's, it is as purple as that. That's not oversaturated or anything. They are that colour. And they smell floral. They're almost perfumed and they're quite meaty. Um, those those really come when the frosts start to come, the light frosts. They're an, uh, an early winter mushroom, really. Um, so when some of the early autumn stuff starts to fade, you start looking for bluets. And then the other one is just an amazing colour. It's a green cracking brittle gill. And it's I just love that sort of copper oxide or sort of malachite green. It's just stunning. Quite nutty. Yeah, and that one you could eat raw as well. Look, yeah, looking at those, I, I don't think I've ever seen mushrooms with such such a blue colour. Are, are they unique to a certain area or anything like that? No, um, I think it's more of a habitat thing than a regional thing with those. You just need the right leaf litter and they, they, they're a saprophyte so they grow on leaf litter rather than being associated with a tree or a particular species of tree or grasses. Yeah, okay. Oh. Right, um, so moving on. Rose hips, um, again, most people know that rose petals maybe are edible because you've had Turkish Delight and that kind of thing. But the rose hips are probably even more valuable, really. They're packed with vitamin C. They've got nine times more vitamin C by weight than oranges. And we've got them growing everywhere. I just don't know why we don't bother to use them. And I think it might be because they're a hassle. They've got those irritant hairs in, so you've got to strain them and all that kind of thing. But you know, in sort of wartime that they made rose hip syrup to give to the kids and things to stop them getting rickets and all that sort of thing. So it's a brilliant source of vitamin C, uh, but it's also tasty. It makes a lovely ketchup. You can make a lovely like rose hip syrup, chicle tart or something. There's lots of things you could do that you can do with it. So it's um, quite a fruity flavour. It's nice. It's good. It's in the apple family. Did I hear you say at the beginning there that it had something to do with Turkish delight? Well, rose petals make the the rose oil, uh, the rose water that would be used in the rose flavoured part of Turkish Delight. You've got rose and lemon, don't you, normally? In a, you get the pink and the yellow. Um, traditionally, the, it's rose petals that will make it. Sweets, you know. I'd like to have some sweets. I, know. I made my dad some this year for um, for Father's Day because he, he loves Turkish Delight and I, I made some out of... Um, rose petals for the rose ones and then uh, lemon and elderflower the yellow ones so it's quite nice wow wow i bet that was a treat <laughs> they were nice yeah um a couple more that are sort of related these are related to those yellow chanterelles we saw at the beginning but these ones um the black ones on the side there they're called the trumpet of death and those are my absolute favorite mushroom ever they are delicious so so tasty and i think it's because they're slightly elusive they're they're really hard to spot they're rarely as obvious as they seem in that photo they just look they look just like decaying oak leaves and it's just virtually impossible to see them but if you spot some you've got to stand absolutely still and look around you because if there's some there's probably absolutely tons of them and you, you do you just do the dance of courage and joy because it's oh my goodness i mean a whole patch of them and that's why they have their other name uh the horn of plenty craterellus cornucopioides and cornucopia the horn of plenty so they might be uncommon but they are locally abundant and if there is a patch there's usually hundreds of them so it's always a brilliant thing to find so looking at that picture then is that as big as they get about the size of an oak leaf and and why the trumpet of death they're probably sort of around they're sort of um i don't know why um yeah sort of I don't know, the size of a Satsuma Leaf. is the biggest they would get. They're usually smaller. Um, and they're... Um, sorry, what did you ask me? The other, the, why the name, did I, it get the name Trumpet of Death? Death. 
I think it's just their sort of funereal colours. Um, it's actually a mistranslation from the French because the French is trompette de la mort, um, of the dead. I think it's supposed to be sort of end of days, judgment day sort of thing, uh, like the, the trumpets of judgment day or something like that. Trumpets of the dead is where it comes from. So the trumpet, so trumpet of death is a mistranslation. Um, so it should be color, trumpets though. of the dead. Beautiful colour. They are amazing. And then the other ones there are winter chanterelles, which are very abundant right now, and they're just coming into their own. And they have a yellow stem. But again, the top is brown. It's just really hard to see them. They're very well camouflaged. <laughs> but they're, they're tasty. I think they're really underrated. Um, September into October, you see these parasol mushrooms, which were also in your opening sequence while we were waiting for the time to start. Um, these are huge. They can be the size of a dinner plate. I mean, they can be absolutely massive. And they grow on heathland or sort of grassland on cliff, cliff tops, that kind of thing, grazing fields. I don't see them a lot in Leeds, but I went down south to see my family and there was just, I just happened to be there on the week that they were all out and it was brilliant. And I made this gorgeous pie and I wanted to um, make the top of it look like the mushroom. So that pie is like, a, I don't know, a 20 or 25 inch uh, centimetre pie, pie dish. And it was really, really peaked. And to, st to make the um, pastry stay up, I had to do a pillar of mash in the middle to rest the top on. So it had all the lovely mushroomy, chestnutty, um, saucy stuff inside it. And then in the middle was a pillar of mash. So when you cut in, you got the mash on your plate as well. And it was, <laughs> it was a really good pie. <laughs> I had to make it again. Sounds great. The, uh, while you're yeah, well, talking about cooking and, uh, and obviously discussing the, the different mushrooms, I'm, I'm very naive at this, I'm only very little practice, but do I assume <laughs> that you cook them all roughly the same kind of way, that, that if you were to put them in a stew, that's how you would cook all of them, all the different uh, mushrooms you might gather that would make that sort of pie taste gorgeous, or do you cook them slightly differently and put them in the stew as, as, as it's all being put into the oven, as it were? I normally fry mushrooms off first to make sure they're cooked properly, but it also adds a lot more flavour. I think the reason a lot of people don't like mushrooms is because they've had those royal little slimy button mushrooms in dodgy hotel breakfasts and stuff, mm -hmm. and that, that's what they think mushrooms are. <laughs> and I think frying them gives them a much better caramelisation, that that um, Maillard reaction that, that caramelises the sugars and, and changes the actual food to get that that browning on them that's where the flavor comes from but also you want to get as much of that water out of them as possible because that's what makes them slimy and that texture a lot of people don't like about mushrooms if you can cook out a lot of that water it'll intensify the flavor the texture will be better and yeah you can get that golden brown on them that, that you want so I almost always cook them first so I can control it because I think stews in a casserole or whatever it's such a slow low cook that it doesn't really do the job so I would get the casserole ready and but I would fry them up and then put them in okay and and to add to the cooking process then with the the mushroom there you've got in your hand um, would you take the skin off and cut the, the base off and then dust them down with a brush or slice them up before you fry them or do you leave them sort of pretty well whole? Uh, that one uh, is great because you would take the stem off. The stem is very um, tough. It's quite fibrous. So it's the cap you're looking to eat on this particular one. That said, I did pull it apart and put the stem in the dehydrator because you can grind it up into a powder. So don't waste it. But it was not you couldn't eat that as a piece of mushroom. The, the cap, which is just a great big flat disc almost, uh, I didn't I didn't chop it up. I just pulled it from the edge and you end up getting these sort of triangles. The gills naturally pull it. So you end up with these these sort of segments. And then I fried those up like that. And I left them quite large because they they shrink a lot when you cook them. So, so you, I had maybe this... like inch wide segments. So you leave the skin on then, the, the, the upper skin on. Is that yeah. the same for all mushrooms? Um, pretty much. There's only there's some families in the um, – there's some beliefs, which are the ones with sponge under. I'll show you some in a minute. Um, there's some of those that the skin can give you 
farts for the next 24 hours of you eat them with the skin on. So we tend to peel those ones. And I think people peel puffballs sometimes. It's just because the skin's a bit tough. But generally the skin doesn't hurt you if the mushroom doesn't. And um, sorry, for cleaning, no. it's all yeah. – I pick as clean as I can anyway. I usually trim on site, and I, which means that those stem butts go back into the environment it came from and might make some more colonies, you never know. But also it keeps my basket nice and clean because anything, especially with gills or anything sort of soft and convoluted like your cauliflower, you don't want dirt from the bottoms of mushrooms going in all over the other ones you've just picked because mostly they're well above the soil and they're clean. So if you pick clean and you trim before you put it in the basket, you rarely need to wash or do anything to them. Oh, that's a good tip. That's, that's a good tip. tip. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. If you soak mushrooms, they will just sponge it up and you will lose all the flavour and they'll just be soggy. Uh, okay. Uh, sea buckthorn. This one's good people for coastal people, but actually I found this in Leeds. It had been planted as part of a, I don't know, a sort of municipal planting. But normally it's coastal. And these berries, they are bright orange. They're about the size of, you know, sort of pea size, a little bit longer, a little bit more elongated. And they are very similar to passion fruit. They're really, really sour, but very strong flavour. And they're great in cocktails, custards, you know, syrups. Um, they're, they're just brilliant. They're quite, they've got quite a few pips in and stuff. So I tend to juice them first and then use the juice and stuff rather than putting them in whole because there's just too many pips. Okay. But they're absolutely fabulous. Oh, these have got to be and the then, gold dust of, of well, mushrooms, surely. <laughs> Fine truffles. They always ask me this. And firstly, you have to be on the right soil. And they really love chalky and sometimes limey soil. So the south of England, Sussex, Hampshire, that, that sort of thing, Dorset, they've got chalky soil and therefore they have truffles. Um, and then you... If you don't have a pig you can train, then you can train a dog and they don't tend to eat them. Although saying that, my friend who's you can see in the top corner there, Melissa, she has truffle dogs and she takes people out foraging for truffles. And I, I gate crashed her course one day and went along and um, that's what we found in the day. And it was just mental how many truffles there were. The dogs were on fire and they were having such a good time. And um, that's what we were finding. They're summer and winter truffles. They're not quite the same as the ones that you see on the continent um the really really high price high price commanding ones but they're starting to migrate over here because we're getting warmer so we are starting to find some of those really expensive truffles in the uk just like the champagne region is now too hot and we're growing champagne quality grapes in the south of england because the climate is now like champagne used to be 50 years ago and um, forgive me, but I've never tasted or seen a truffle. So what what is the overpowering taste? What's the what? Why do why are they worth so much money? It's hard. A lot of people won't like them. They're intense. Yeah, really, really intense flavour. They're very earthy, a little bit perfumed. I think I can't put it better than I think it was Hugh Fernie Whittingstall or it was John Wright on River Cottage. They were saying it was like a cross between sex and socks. And that really is right. <laughs> <laughs> you the lunch. It's very weird flavour. I don't know why they're so popular, but they really are. And of course, they're supposed to be like a aphrodisiac or something. But um, they are they are an incredible flavour, and I do like it. But a little goes a long way, uh, especially goes well with eggs, with um, under the skin of chickens if you've got the winter um, winter ones. The okay, summer so, ones so you should question, question then. So if, if, if you've got one, which is the size of a, a normal mushroom, I'd say a golf ball type sort of size, um, how much of that would you use in a, a dish of any kind? And, and if you didn't use all of it, how would you then keep it? Would you dry it, slice it, dice it, whatever, and then dry it or something to keep it as a flavour for later on? It depends which truffle you have. So you need to know the qualities and the, the characteristics of um, the truffle type that you have. So the summer truffles, you must have them raw, otherwise you will lose all the flavour. If you cook them or you dry them, they just don't taste anymore. The winter one can take cooking um, and can be dried and put into salt and that kind of thing. So you could, yeah, you could you could make a truffle salt. You'd probably just grate it into the salt uh, raw and the salt will preserve it. And then you just put that on your food and stuff. 
if you're making sort of scrambled eggs on toast or, or a great big pile of, I don't know, some creamy, cheesy pasta or something like that, you, I think you would just put like five or six slices, very thin slices, or you would you grate a quarter of it or something on there because it would just be too much otherwise. Um, and if it was the ones from the continent, you'd need even less because they are super pungent. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I think Rose has got a couple of comments coming in from people about truffles and what they found. So we'll just nip over to Rose oh, a second. Yeah, yeah um, we were just saying about the parasols. I know, I know for me, it's one that I recognise quite easily. And uh, I was just saying, there's lots of other people seen it. And Lee Stone was saying that they'd, uh, he'd had lots um, uh, down in Kent, lots of hundreds of them. And um, Smuggy Walk said the same thing. And you're talking about uh, flavours from truffles and, and so forth. And uh, uh, Lee's just come up with a really good one for uh, the taste of the parasols. And he said they taste like fragrant dirt, which I thought was quite an mm, interesting one. <laughs> oh, <laughs> hi, Lee. <laughs> How are you? Um, yeah, I don't know. I quite like them. The ones I had were really, really mushroomy and nice. Um, but some people have said they were like, polystyrene so I think a lot of it matters about how wet they are how much rain there was right before because I think if it was quite dry before um they're more intense and more tasty whereas if there's been tons and tons of rain I think they can be quite bland so it, it might be that you got them on a bad day and I got one on a good day but I, I don't know but they are um variable you can bread them as well so you can basically a scallop them or, or sort of schnitzel them um make sort of goujons or whatever you, you can dip them in flour then egg then breadcrumbs and fry them and that's really nice sort of vegetarian wow well i think it's, it's almost as if it's almost as if you you can you find one and then you've got all these different cooking ideas you're going to do with it and it's just like no i, I can only use the one <laughs> i know yeah well, yeah, because absolutely. I never find parasols, so I was really happy. I found, I don't know, 20 of them. And so I just made all these parasol recipes down at my mum's and I just like took over the kitchen and made this pie and the, you know, the little escalopy things and dried some and oh, I just did all sorts of stuff with them. Um, and it was it was really fun because they don't keep. And I just dried some, which I'll make into powder because they are delicious. But yeah, there are shaggy parasols as well, which are a slightly different species, and they go carroty red when you cut them, and they don't have the snakeskin uh, pattern on the stem. They're not poisonous; they're still edible, but they do give some people gastric upset if, even when they're cooked, there's shaggy parasols. So you, again, you need to know the difference between those two, and you need to test your own tolerance. I can eat them, and they're delicious. Great. Okay, folks. Well, we're going to have a bit of a break for a second because I want to play you a clip about what's coming uh, on the live stream next Wednesday, which I think anybody that's inter interested in backpacking, and particularly lightweight backpacking, will be fascinated with just as much as, uh, as I am looking forward to the interview. Uh, while this is going on, uh, there's a bit of a delay between you're seeing this and obviously the messages coming through. So if you've got some questions uh, that we've covered already that you'd like to flag up, and obviously what happens after this, if anything else immediately comes to mind, just put a capital Q at the beginning of it. I've got a couple appearing in the chat I can see now, and we'll gather them together for a QA and a at the, at the very end. But uh, have a look at this and then think about joining us next week. In 1955, Louise Lamotte and Lucy Seeds did not flinch when they read in the Columbus Dispatch that their 67-year-old mother, Emma Gatewood, was somewhere in Virginia, hiking a little-known trail across the Appalachian Mountains. After her children had left home, instead of moving to Florida and joining a bridge club, Emma, or Grandma Gatewood as she was best known, set off on a more remarkable journey to become the first woman to walk the entire 2,050 miles in 145 days of the now-famous US Trail. Today, her name is iconic within the lightweight backpacking community, as she carried only 15 pounds of supplies and a tiny amount of food in a simple knapsack on her shoulder, hiking in sneakers, sleeping under a shower curtain and living off the land. Not only that, she did it again two years later, followed by the Oregon Trail, then aged 71. 
On Wednesday, I'll be talking with author Ben Montgomery, who found that Grandma Gatewood was in fact his mother's great aunt, and hear the previously unearthed stories about this amazing woman, her diaries, her gritty life, and what led her to set off on a trail, all of which can be found in his fascinating biography, Grandma Gatewood's Walk. Join us Wednesday at 7pm UK time to find out more about this unique woman. So yes, if you're interested in uh, backpacking and uh, lightweight backpacking, the Grandma Gatewood is a name that gets mentioned on, in the annals many, many times. And uh, it is a fascinating book and I'm really looking forward to the interview. So join us next week. Anyway, let's get back to mush. And uh, we've, got, uh, we've got Lisa, Lisa, a cup of tea and some velvet shanks. Yes. So now we're coming into more the winter mushrooms. Uh, the grey oysters and these velvet shanks are ones that you can look out for all winter. They, they prefer the colder months. Um, they're actually the same as in the enoki mushrooms you get in the shops or in Asian supermarkets and things like that. Um, but they're usually long and thin with tiny little pinheads, and that's because they're grown up a tube in the dark so to make them really long, and they aren't given any light, which is why they don't turn orange like this. They, um, these are small and a bit slimy on the top when they're wet. They're very nutty when you fry the caps up. The stems are a little tough, but they have, I don't know if you can see in the middle, but it's it's got a dark velvety stem that gets darker and darker towards the bottom and it, it really is velvety and that's one of the um, id features for this there isn't a ring on the stem and it has a whitish spore print um like gills and it or, or con con color us with the cap really sort of pale gills and the one you need to know about particularly um as a lookalike is the funeral bell which would probably be out a little earlier in the year, but they can overlap. Um, that one is deadly, it's Gallerina marginata, and it is more domed, but very similar colour. It does have a ring on the stem and it won't have that velvety foot. Um, and it won't, I don't think they're particularly slimy and they're often two-tone as well. Um, the hygrophagonus or something it's called, but it's um, where some parts dry out and some parts stay moist and that makes a two-tone effect. But they're um, lighter on the margin, I think, those ones. But, yeah, look them up and make sure you know how to tell anything apart from the funeral bell, especially if you're going to be looking for uh, velvet shanks. Would, would it be right in saying that uh, the best advice or the, well, it is advisable to um, work out which are the most poisonous ones, first of all, so you can actually avoid them rather than, keep hunting, hoping that you can eat whatever it is you find. Absolutely. That's really good advice. And, and that's what I always start my course is saying um, after, if in doubt, leave it out. It's also the, but the place to start is with the poisonous things. So learn the most poisonous plants. So like your hemlock and your hemlock water drop wet. Uh, there's a few other ones as well. Deadly nightshade, all that kind of thing. Fox gloves. Make sure you know what those look like. Um, and then for the mushrooms, it would be Death Cat, Destroying Angel, um, Funeral Bell, The Fool's Funnel, Ivory Funnel. There's, there's, there's various ones that are very, very toxic. Not that many, not as many as you'd think. Excuse okay, me. I was going to ask, um, what sort of number do you think, I mean, just roughly, obviously not super accurate, but what, 10, 20, 50? 30, 50 out of thousands and thousands and thousands right. um, that are really, really deadly. Yeah. Most of them would make you very ill and maybe damage your organs, but you'd have to have quite a lot of them to, to be killed by them. But still, organ damage isn't ideal. Um, but then there's other ones that would just make you very sick and ill and maybe not a particularly good mental experience as well at the same time. And, and then you'd probably be OK. But um, the very deadliest ones, there's, there's not as many as you'd think, but you don't get a second chance with them. So you absolutely need to know what yes, those look yeah, like yes. because then when you're looking around if you see anything that has any of those characteristics then it should send up big alarm bells and you should double check that thing against those first okay okay good to know hmm. uh, and then just finally we haven't really talked about the coast in this particular one that much we've talked about the sea buckthorn but seaweeds um coming into the spring seaweeds start to 
be in quite good condition. So over the winter, things like the pepper dolls like this one, this is the truffle of the sea. We talked about truffles from the soil, but um, this is the truffle of the sea and it is the most amazing flavour. It's, it's, I think I like it more than truffles, actually. It's just and a big umami hit. It's absolutely incredible. Um, it's quite small, so the, the fronds are sort of this big and the, they're all sort of ferny. Um, or the Osmondea part, that, that, that's the same um, name as the, the royal fern, the actual plant. So it's all connected. And yeah, this it grows on the rocks and it's um, really delicious. There's tons of different seaweeds. That would be a whole different talk. I could talk about just seaweeds for an hour, no problem. But yeah, that one is a nice one that I like to pick sort of towards the end of winter coming into spring. Um, that one is particularly good then because it gets quite sun damaged in the, in the summer. So you want it this dark browny, reddish colour and um, not, not the very red ones in between. That's something else. It's those big frondy brown ones um, that you want. But yeah, there are seaweeds that are incredibly tasty. Okay. Okay, excellent. And as we continue, don't forget to put a quite a cue at the beginning of your question, folks, so we can add it to the to the list at the end here. Uh, and then finally, just to, to talk about a couple of medicinal things, which because winter is a good time to pick a lot of these. Plus, you need them more, more in winter because it's flu season and all the rest of it. So we've got um, two here. There's the turkey tail mushroom, which is um, Chamatis versicolor, and that is stripy and it's sort of um it's, it's a bracket that's quite frilly has this bright white edge and then these colorful rings so it's so cool because if when when a, a male turkey puts its tail up it is just this sort of bands of color with the white at the edge um and they can be like navy blue and bronze and like dark crimson forest green so all those stripes are, are all different colors it's really really majestic when you get a really colorful one and when it's nice and young you get really vibrant colors um and i'll come on to properties in a sec because they're quite similar to the chaga on the right there which is i've got one here actually this is a i don't know like a parasite a, a disease um a fungal infection of a tree and it makes these black conks that stick out of the side. This is a piece. I think I have to put it in front of my face for it to focus. <laughs> That's it. This is just a piece that's dried out, but it has um, black on the outside, black and crumbly. And it has sort of cinnamon, ambery brown on the inside of the conch, which is the big growth that sticks out of the bit, usually a birch tree. Um, and it's usually in the colder north. And you, then once you go into Scandinavia and Siberia, there's tons of it, China. Um, and it's they're both they pull things out of the birch and and like betulinic acid is one of the things. And I can't remember what exactly what it does in our body, but it, it boosts our immune system and supports it. So it's not a cure for anything like some people may claim online, but it will help you fight colds, viruses flu arguably a coronavirus maybe we don't know there's no research on it but i don't see why not um it's also anti-tumor so it's it's antibacterial you know it, it just helps us fight off foreign bodies and diseases beasties that we don't want in our body and it helps our body do its natural defenses okay and sorry i missed the the, the, you, sorry. Uh, sorry i missed where you said you could find them at the moment is it at the moment you look for those? Yeah, um, really it's Scotland uh, is what you're talking about in the UK. Um, it's it's not super common. So if you're going to take some, just take, you know, a lump or two for yourself. Don't don't go harvesting everything because, the, it, you know, it's, whilst it is a parasite and it does kill the tree, we still don't want it to become extinct in the UK or something. But, you know, a, a block will go a long way because you, you make tea from it and you can boil it again and again and again and you, you keep making more and more from it. You don't need much to make a batch of tea. And it's like coffee. It's like black coffee. It's quite bitter, but also has a little sweetness to it. You can add sugar to it if you want or honey or whatever you like. Honey, of course, is good for you as well. And that's antibacterial and all the other things, antiviral. And um, I just yeah make a batch for a week or whatever because it, it doesn't last forever 
So I just make a batch, leave a bottle in the fridge, and then I just I add a shot to my morning coffee or I just have it as a drink on its own, like the top there. And um, I just don't get ill very often mm. at all. Um, so I think it does have benefits. The other thing I have a lot of is elderberry because I make vinegars and I have that on almost everything. So I just can't get enough of this gorgeous balsamic vinegar. And again, elderberry is really antiviral. It, it it has, I can't remember what the chemical is. Oh, I probably should have swatted up on this. It, it has a chemical which produces more um, cytokines, which are part of the immune system, and those then go and do their job and, and help fight off more things as that come into the into the body. So it, elderberry is incredibly good for you. And we're a bit late this year for you to go out and pick your own, although you can get dried elderberries from winemakers and things like that because people have them to add body to wine. Um, but next September, stock your freezer up with elderberry, make a cough syrup. Oh, it really loosens um, chest coughs as well. Any sort of mucusy, phlegmy stuff, um, catar, um, catar, whatever you call it. Uh, elderberry really helps loosen all of that and, and purges it. So it, it's it's really good for you. Um, so, if, you know, if you're going to have a, a squash or whatever, instead of blackcurrant or whatever, ha- why not have elderberry? It's still got all the vitamin C but it's got other benefits as well. Excellent. And that's just okay. me making a fire on the beach with some, um, what is there? We've got razor clam shells, but I've got some, it was a roadkill pheasant and duck that I found on, on route to the beach and um, cooked cooked the breasts and things on, on a hot stone in the middle of the fire. But then I've had these razor shells in my car from having eaten the razor clams before and used them to put this the skewers on um because they burnt away in the fire but it, it kept them safe until um they were cut oh, very nice very nice um i went to, in fact rose and i went on a, a walk with uh, somebody similar to yourself who was uh, a, a mushroom specialist there is a technical name and i've completely forgotten what it is uh in this Mycologist. area and say again mycologist that's the word i can't spell it but i can only just say it and the uh, she was she was quite uh, philosophical about how nature um, when you come out of winter there's that celebration of of life uh, and new, renewed life and things beginning and and the type of things that she was showing us to to eat just as you've been saying really we're all about purging the past purging all the 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 the, the um, salted foods and all the rest of it they had over the winter period uh, and then the same as you say during the autumn period before they went into winter and. The way they used to pre- preserve foods uh, in all their different forms, whether they've been smoked, dried, or, or, or whatever it may be. But it was an interesting philosophy, really. It is. And, you know, if you go back and listen to the one we had before in spring, we were talking about lots of greens and lushness and that sort of vitality that comes from all those new, fresh, young plants. Uh, there is something to say, though, because I didn't go into nettles and that kind of stuff. Normally, we associate good fresh nettles with spring but they do often make a resurgence certainly in Yorkshire they they've all died they've flowered they've seeded they die down to nothing but then in September when all the rain comes back and it gets a bit colder again it almost has a second spring and you get loads of new growth of nettles and they're also incredibly good for you um they're a superfood they're full of lots of plant protein as well as all the minerals and things that it contains so nettle tea and putting nettles in your food like you would spinach is a really good thing to do as well. And we get another treat in autumn because some will come up. Right. Fantastic. Well, come on, folks, let's get some questions uh, lined up. Let's challenge Lisa if we can and uh, <laughs> see what she can come up with with different answers. Uh, be it about fungi, about autumn foods generally or autumn fruit, uh, not so much the, the uh, coastal uh, type of questions at the moment because it's uh, a bit easier to do inland but wherever you are in the in the country or wherever you are in in europe or or the world watching us at the moment uh do drop us a quick note to say where you are and if you're new to uh, to the stream and if you have any particular questions i'm looking at the screen at the moment i can see them popping up but uh, we're going to go over to uh, to lisa and have some questions in a minute um the one thing that uh, you well we did discuss at the very beginning uh, before we started the stream uh, and you said it was very important to you, which I'd just like to touch on. 
Uh, was you saying about the effect that foraging has on your mental health? Yeah, I think it's always worth talking about mental health, but I think it's even more important at the moment. On a normal year, it's important this time of year because the days are getting shorter and we have less light. Um, you've got to go and get your vitamin D, like you've got to get outside and some of your skin has got to get some sunlight on it to get that vitamin D um, produced in, in our skin. Um, but it's also the mental part of it. it it's getting out of the house, um, getting some fresh air, getting a bit of exercise. I just think it can be harder to do that in winter, especially in all weathers or whatever. And I, I just made a little video actually a, couple, a week ago, a couple of weeks ago, that's on my Facebook feed. Um, it's about 20 minutes. And the idea was that I was going out for my own benefit. And I just sort of filmed it almost and talked a bit about why it's important to me um something people can share if they want to send it to someone else but it's not just me talking about mushrooms although I am doing that um it's also just listening and breathing and it's funny when if you watch someone else on the screen take a massive breath you, you can't but help but do it yourself as well it's really interesting um so I did that and yeah, there's been a lot of positive comments. A lot of people were saying, thank you for that. Like, I needed that this morning. I, I really felt like I was there with you. And I, I feel better just for watching this, let alone actually going and doing it. And I will. I'm going to go out tonight before it gets dark. I'm going to go out. And it was so nice to hear. And I just think that's just a normal winter thing. But on top of that, we've got our lockdowns, our restrictions, the coronavirus crisis and all this sort of thing going on. So people have had a tough year and a lot of people haven't been able to go out at all because they're classed as vulnerable or their their area is really high with um, cases and, and deaths and things so there will be more locked down than other places and I think yeah I think there's going to be a massive mental health recovery period needed after this because there is all that shut inside stuff but a lot of people have financial worries and terrified of getting the virus or that their parents will or someone they care about and or they're working flat out to keep everybody safe and healthy you know in their um in their jobs in the NHS so yeah I think there's a lot to be said for mental health and I think going outside is absolutely vital to me personally and the great thing about foraging is that you don't need to be super fit you can go yeah. slow and in fact you should you should go slow because then you, you'll spot things. You can't, you can't really jog and forage. Not really. Um, so it's a nice slow activity that anybody can do as long as yeah. they can can walk and get outside. Or okay, yeah, it's a good thing to do. Okay. Well, while uh, people are formulating their questions, um, obviously I put the slide up there of your social media. Is there any particular one that you sort of keep uh, on top of on a regular basis? What What would you suggest people follow most of all? Is the visual one from the from the Instagram point of view? Yeah, I I update my Instagram pretty much every day. I try and post something every day. Um, so that's the one that's the most active and that's the one where you'll find what I'm finding and where I'm going and what's going on. And um, people seem to like that. So that's lovely. And I do post recipes and things there sometimes. But then my Facebook is the next one that I update as much. And often there'll be longer posts or the full recipe or if it's a longer video that won't fit on Instagram, then um, it'll be on my Facebook page or linked to my YouTube channel. But, yeah, there's a cross link there. and then. Twitter, I must admit, I haven't really used very much lately, but um, I do check that now and again. But if you want to get hold of me or if you want to see what's actually going on and what, what I'm finding at the moment, my Instagram is probably the best one to follow for um, dynamic interaction. Okay, okay. Well, we've got a few questions that are, that are coming in at the moment, so I'm going to pop them on the screen now and uh, you, can, you can provide the people with your, your wisdom. About the parasol mushroom, says Raj, uh, what's the best way to tell them apart from a false parasol? Uh, the, by false parasol, I assume you mean the shaggy parasol. Um, so the, the true parasol is Macrolepiota procera, 
and it's the one that was in the photo of me holding it earlier if you want to wind back to that later and have a good look it is much larger usually and it's got really beautiful scales on it very dark in the center both of them have that but oh thank you that's perfect but can you see this the stem on that one it has this black and white snake skin pattern and that is a really key feature for the macrolepiota the true parasol i haven't got a picture of a shaggy parasol but it is more shaggy that the scales are bigger and there's more of them um and the stem is smooth it's all one color kind of a beigey gray color they both have a ring on the stem and that ring moves up and down which most mushrooms don't most of the time rings stay put on the stem but yeah look at look at the stem uh for that snake skin pattern but also when you cut it or damage it or you pull the cap apart the shaggy parasol the, the, the not the true parasol will stain carroty red the true parasol will stay white when you cut it or pull it apart so the two key features are look at the stem and whether it stains red or not okay okay um heather has uh, has got a question we would be very interested in a seaweed talk obviously we can't do that tonight in detail but love far eastern cookery and seaweed works really well with it it does um, I do some Eastern cookery and sort of Japanese inspired or, or Korean and all, you know, lots of Asian countries use a lot of seaweed. And it's really weird that we don't because we are an island. Uh, but I think we've just culturally, for whatever reason, have come to a point where we're really suspicious of wild food and people don't want to do peasanty things sort of in the Victorian times. And since then, we, we've lost these skills and it's really sad that you can get seaweed, especially in health food shops. And sometimes it is from Ireland or from Cornwall or whatever, or from Scotland. So you can source British seaweed as well that has been sustainably harvested. But for myself, I tend to just grind it up. Um, I find some really good ones. So maybe dulse, uh, which is a red, purpley red frondy seaweed, quite like acetate. It's almost like a lighting gel. It's really see-through, but it's red and that's one of the ones that I like to dry and grind up because it's almost like smoky bacon when it's dried. It's really tasty. And I just I scatter a bit of that on everything I eat pretty much. So my sort of standard thing is, you know, the, the meal's ready to go, whether it's a salad or a pile of anything. I don't know. Um, mash or something. I, I'll, I'll just a lasagna. I'll still scatter a bit of that on top because it doesn't taste of the sea. It tastes of savoury tastiness it's a bit salty as well so I don't always salt my food I, I tend to put seaweed on it and it it sounds odd but because it's just ground up it just I don't know it, it just adds umami without fishy or seaweediness um so and, and it's so packed with vitamins so you've got iodine and things like that that we really need especially women need iodine and we, we don't tend to get enough of it from our food these days without supplements so again, putting seaweed on all my food that isn't really part of the recipe. It's just part of the, if you were going to grind salt and pepper on, I also put the seaweed on the top. And yeah, it means I get some extra vitamins and minerals into my diet without even having to come up with a recipe for seaweed all the time. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Uh, Mark Jost, I picked some whores and made fruit leathers. Um, are there any health benefits of whores? Yeah, these are great questions, guys. Thank you for these. Um, yes, I touched on it earlier, but we're going to come back to it. The hawthorn, uh, now I'm not, a, I'm not a medical herbalist, so you must research all of this stuff yourself, but I know that hawthorn, um, the whole plant actually, but the berries are the easiest thing to use because they're the most delicious. Hawthorn is good for your circulatory system and your heart and blood pressure and things like that. So a lot of drugs we have pharmaceutically either raise blood pressure or lower blood pressure but hawthorn the active ingredients in hawthorn actually um regulate it so it's kind of does what what's needed it, it's amazing really so you could you could make a syrup out of the flowers you can make a water <laughs> so i just gave myself with the oven i just lent on the ignition um the uh, that surprised me um 
you can make a syrup with the flowers. It's called May Blossom. You can make cocktails and things with that. It's got some medicinal as well, of course. <laughs> um, or you can make a ketchup. That's what I tend to do. You can also have the young leaves in a tea or just scattered in a salad. They've got an amazing bite to them, hawthorn leaves. They're quite substantial. They're very, very flexible and stuff, but they have a real bite to them. They're great sort of in sandwiches or in salads. So, again, it's another spring treat that I really enjoy. Um, there's plenty mm -hmm. of hawthorn uh, ketchup recipes online, but there is one on my I think I did a blog about it. If not, it's on my Facebook page somewhere. Um, poor ketchup. Excellent. I've got okay. a um, nice one as well. We've got about uh, three more questions to, to, to come. Um, this is from, uh, where are we? Is it coming through? No, it's not coming through at the moment. Let's just try the next one. The flying sprout. I've heard that chicken in the woods can affect some people. Is this true? And how would you go about testing your tolerance? Yes, good question. Chicken of the woods, which isn't the brown one that we saw earlier. Chicken of the woods is bright yellow and bright orange. And that grows up the tree, usually on oak, but sometimes some other ones. And it is... Um, very meaty and everything but it absolutely must be cooked really really well so I again the frying so I wouldn't put it in a curry raw or put it on a pizza raw or anything like that because it just won't get cooked enough to a higher temperature so I would I would pull it apart chop it up a little bit have make sure that it can all get in contact with the pan and be cooked on a really high hard heat until it's well browned and everything and then I know that it's had the right temperature all the way through it then I'll put it into whatever I'm doing, whether that's a stew or a curry or a um, salad, you know, use it like um, warm chicken salad sort of thing. You must cook it on its own first. Um, you can still put garlic and seasoning and all that sort of stuff with it, but just make sure it gets that high heat. Testing your tolerance, it's um, any new food to you. It shouldn't just be ones that are a bit iffy with some people, although you do need to find out if that's the case with any species you're planning to eat. Um, but any new food, you should try a small piece first and leave it 24 hours and just check you haven't had any gastric upsets or any feelings that aren't good in your body, uh, that you're having some kind of allergic reaction or just intolerance to it. And normally that would be vomiting or diarrhea or something like that or just gurgly tummy not feeling very well on it. That's the sort of effect like shaggy parasols or chicken of the woods can have for people. I do think a lot of them haven't cooked it long enough, though, as well. It's not the sort of one you can just show a pan and that's enough. You know, it's, you've got to cook it really well. Lewis, all the funnels, that kind of thing as well. They all need that kind of treatment. Um, whereas some mushrooms you can cook a little more al dente if you want. But I, I still think you should cook mushrooms well, really. Um, okay. Yeah. So chicken of the woods is definitely one of those that you should try a small bit first and see if you can get on with it after okay. well cooking it. Okay, this is the one that didn't come through, but it suddenly appeared halfway through the uh, the explanation there. Uh, from Aggie, I hope I pronounced your name right, Rusnik. Uh, what are your thoughts on orange peel mushroom and how would you cook it? Are you talking about the, yeah, the orange peel fungus, which is a, a, a small cup fungus that grows on the ground and it honestly looks like someone's peeled a satsuma and just left it in the woods it's it i've been tricked by many real orange peels <laughs> thinking they were orange peel fungus and realized no it's just orange peel but the orange peel fungus is um it's very delicate and it doesn't taste of anything really so i don't really eat it i have tried it for my um edible fungi found tried and not died list but that's the only time I've really had it because it just didn't taste of anything. So I, I wouldn't really recommend cooking it. I think it might be one that you can have raw. Check that online. I wouldn't cook it very much because it would just fall apart. It's far too brittle and far too delicate. Um, it might be one that you could put on a salad. But I honestly don't think it's worth eating that much just because it's, it's tasteless and very delicate. It might okay. not be very useful to eat uh, easy to put into something check check um, on that though do, do research whether it's edible at uh, raw or not and the final question from ross johnson um we have been eating quite a few uh tripping funnels i think he means trooping funnels 
He's supposed to be trooping funnels. Yeah, yeah, he did, he did add an, an extra uh, spelling correction after this. Uh, what are the best characteristics to tell them apart from lookalikes like the common funnel and even the clouded Aragic? Ar- Ar- Agaric? Garic? Yeah. How do you pronounce um, that? Agaric just means, because you hear, hear the word in the fly agaric as well, like my little, um, my little lights here, is the uh, red and white spotty ones. Agaric just means cap and stem mushroom. It's not actually a species. Just like a bracket fungus, it's kind of in the same broad stroke as saying a bracket fungus, which is something that comes in shelves out of a tree. And agaric is a cap and definite stem. Um, so they're often called the clouded funnel these days because of that confusion, because they are actually in the funnel family. Um, funnels, a lot of people, not a lot of people, some people have trouble with all the funnels for gastric stuff. So you need to be aware of that. I need to say that at the beginning, but I can eat them and they're delicious. Um, the difference is, well, the trooping funnel has a, a little raised umbo in the middle of the cap, when, especially when it's younger. So although the funnel is going up and out like a like a, a inside out umbrella, in the very centre, it's got a little raised umbo. And that can be helpful for the trooping funnel. Trooping funnel is about, about this big. Um, very uniform. It's got a very straight stem and very martini glass-like funnel tops. They're kind of a nudey, beigey, peachy, creamy colour. Um, whereas the common funnel is smaller and bit bit lighter. It's not so. It just doesn't have that hint of or peachy orange for my eyes. Um, it's definitely much smaller than the trooping funnel. And then the clouded funnel, uh, the clouded agaric is um, grey. It, it's not got any warm tones to it at all. It is like so. It was like it's a white mushroom that someone has airbrushed some grey right in the middle. It's like a, it's like a grey rain cloud, and they're quite a different colour. And they often go quite frilly around the edge. So they start off very uniform. And this is the one we're seeing a lot in the forums at the minute, the mushroom forums. People have found a baby clouded agaric and they think it's um, a king oyster that you get from the supermarket. King oysters don't grow here, we're wild. And the baby clouded agarics with their grey tops can look very much like a, a young king oyster, Iringi, um, from the shop. So we're getting a lot of that at the moment. But they, they open out into a much bigger funnel. And they can make humongous rings in the woods. They're spectacular if you see them. Huge rings of whitey grey mushrooms or the, the beigey pinky ones, so beigey, orangey, peachy uh, trooping funnels. So um, First Nature is a really good website to look at ID features and compare them. So if you look up all three of those and read um, Pat O'Reilly's descriptions of them, that is a very useful website once you know what it is that you're looking for. And of course, there's all the uh, the various books to refer to as well. Yeah, so this is just some of my bookshelf um, because we're sort of aiming probably more at beginners here and, and intermediate people. Um, if you had all these books, you'd be doing pretty well for a breadth of coverage. Autumn is much more about mushrooms, but there's lots of plants too. And um, very quickly, then, the Food for Free is one of the best all round foraging books because it's about food. It's not a field guide, but it will go through all the different things that are good to eat. Um, it's an old book, actually. It's been around since the I don't know, 60s or 70s, but it keeps getting redone because it's just brilliant and so important. I would get the big hard copy, a uh, big hardcover version of it because it's much more comprehensive. There's also a little Collins Gem version, but it's got very few species in it. and and you're not likely to find just those species. So it, people get frustrated quickly going, well, I'm finding all these things, but they're not in the book. And it's because it's not a field guide, you know. Whereas um, Roger Phillips, who is amazing, he's just the most gorgeous gent, he's lovely. Uh, he's about 86 now or something, 87, full of energy, absolutely wonderful guy. And he wrote several books one on trees and on wildflowers and ferns and then this one's on mushrooms and it's still even though this was last produced in 2006 it's still one of the best books out there for 
overall encyclopedic uh, sort of field guide. It's got excellent photos and um, yeah, it's, it's a really good book. It also tells you edibility on every single entry, which is fantastic. But because it was around 2006, um, there were some updates since the 80s and things like that. But just always check online in case the information has changed. Oh, look, you've got the see that now the one on the one on the well, looking at you, the one on the left is an older one. So that's an old version of it. Now it's got the white cover like the one on the right there, the wild food one. So the, the mushrooms book matches that. But I've got it here as well. Let me go and find it. But yeah, the um, brilliant. So that's the new cover. The old one's beautiful because they've got really beautifully printed plates on them. It's absolutely lovely, but you need the new version as well, and you need to check online if it's still the case. The edibility of rating is still the same because some things have changed even since then. Um, I've also got the seaweed book, which is on the on the list there as well on the the screen you just had up. Um, yeah, so Wild Food is below that as well. That's one of the newer covers, but the one with the white cover is exactly the same. It's got some great recipes in it. It's been around forever, but it's still really, really good. Great intro. And then the Wildflower Key. There are a few um, wildflower books. Collins do loads and loads of guides. But I particularly like this, the black covered one, but there's there's others as well. And they're all by different authors, so they all have a different... Um, different feel to them you know I haven't got a picture of anything by Jeffrey Kibbe on here but he is amazing he's a field mycologist uh, does a lot of work at Kew and stuff as well which is another fungi center for the UK and um, anything by Jeffrey Kibbe is great he does amazing illustrations and I I can't emphasize how good an illustrated book is for a field guide because they can show all of the features in one picture which is very hard to do in photography and then in the top corner was Emma Gunn's books. I think she's working on the fourth one now, but there's a book for each season, or there will be when the series is finished. And that has fantastic recipes. It's, it's all plant-based, no, no fungi as far as I remember, but she is brilliant. And it's got loads of species in there that aren't in Food for Free, for example. So there's a bigger breadth of plants to play with. And then finally, John Wright. Well, wow, fantastic. He's one of the mushroom well, Lisa, daddies. Mushroom granddad. We've, we've seemed to have gone slightly over our intended hour of content. So I do hope the, the 30 odd people that are actually looking at the, the graph on the screen, the 30 odd people that have stayed with us, thank you very much for staying with us. I hope you've enjoyed chatting or listening to, to what Lisa's got to say and certainly answering some of your questions. I've seen some nice comments come in from various people, Ross and, and Heather, which is very nice of you. Thank you. Um, and yeah. so once again, I do hope that we perhaps touch base with you slightly earlier if once we get our technology sorted early spring, perhaps next year, and have a, a, an update. What do you think? We'd manage oh. to do that? That would be fantastic. Yeah, always a Excellent. pleasure. Thank you for inviting well, me. Oh, of course. You're more than welcome. Um, and of course, if you haven't followed the Outdoor Station, as I say, this is the beginning of a series now of uh, Wednesday nights and possibly more spontaneous uh, streams as interesting things happen, which I'm sort of slowly trying to line up behind the scenes. Do follow us on one of the various places that you can follow us there and uh, we will keep you informed and obviously let you know exactly what's happening when it's happening. So uh, I'm about to uh, run the final credits. Thank you once again, Lisa. It's been a great pleasure talking to you and I do hope that Christmas treats you well you too thank you very much to both of you all right bye for now bye